Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great joy to invite, to welcome you all to the university this evening. It's a wonderful summer's afternoon, and um, it's really a joy always to see people in our Senate room, which we use for special occasions such as these. We've been blessed this year, unusually, with a dozen professorial lectures, and um, this is the penultimate in the spring-summer session. We have two more for the winter series. So welcome, everybody. Pro-Chancellor, Ken Nguyen, always good to have you with us. Many guests from the city, across the university, and on occasions like this, not only do we have many friends, we have family. So let me um, welcome the parents of our lecturer, Professor Evans, this evening. Uh, the parents are here. So is a dear aunt who has had an influence on Professor Evans. Delighted to have her with us. Thank you for coming over. We also have um, Professor Evans' fiance and her parents with us. So welcome to the university. Also some guests to the university, Dr. Omnia Mazuk. Always good to have you, Omnia, on campus. Delighted to have you. And two other guests this evening, if I may mention, Mr. Dick Ruffin from the USA. Welcome, Dick. And Mr. Chris Evans, also friends of, the, of more rearmament initiatives of change. Um, um, Mr. Ruffin and I, with, with Mr. Evans, were speaking early on this afternoon about succession planning and leadership. And uh, pro-chancellor, it's a joy to be able to have these young professors. And I thought, here's an example of the next leaders, the next academic leaders of this university. The university is in good heart because it's rearing some serious scholars for the future. And tonight we're going to experience and hear from one of them, an historian. Also, uh, there is a colleague of ours who works in, in security, who plays football with uh, Professor Evans, and whose son is a budding historian. And they are in the audience, in the audience as well, somewhere. So welcome, and the budding historian too. Uh, Professor Evans, you'll see, is a very accomplished historian. And, I, and to tell you more about him, I'm going to invite the Pro, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Professor Nago, please, to introduce our speaker. Vice Chancellor, colleagues, and distinguished guests, I am delighted to have this opportunity tonight to introduce our professor of modern world history, Professor Bryce Evans, for his inaugural professorial lecture. Professor Evans has achieved the distinction of being promoted to this chair as a result of the outstanding reputation that he has gained in the field externally and internally for being a valued member of the university committee, uh, a community rather. Just to put some context around the promotions, perhaps I should briefly outline that here at Hope, the process for promotion to professorship is extremely rigorous and underpinning it are separate judgments relating to the candidates standing in three equally weighted and equally valued areas of teaching, research, and wider contributions to the discipline, to the school, and to the university. Being extremely good in one area cannot compensate for being poor in another. One has to indeed hit a very high standard in all three. And Professor Evans clearly meets these requirements. I must also add that as part of the inaugural series for this current academic year, and the Vice Chancellor mentioned there, are, uh, there have been uh, 12 promotions. For this current year, academic year, this is the sixth uh, 
personal chair we are celebrating or inaugurating tonight, which is, which is from the School of Humanities, where Professor Evans sits within the, uh, within the subject area of history. So sixth promotions or personal chair from just one school, the School of Humanities. Combine that with the school's recent performance in the RAF 2021, in which the school made submissions in four units of assessments. And the results show that over 52% of the school's research outputs were judged to be internationally excellent or world leading, which in RAF definition is three star and four star level. And history out of those four units as a unit had 62% of their publications or research outputs classified as being of internationally excellent or world leading quality. This explains why we are very proud of our rich humanities tradition at this university. Indeed, uh, while uh, talking about RAF, I must also add that the recent RAF results have shown that the university's quality profile, when we consider the quality profile along with the proportion of eligible staff submitted by the university, and we submitted over 96% of our academic staff, so if we look at the proportion of staff submitted and the quality, that clearly makes us a research intensive institution with a strong foundation for future scholarly ambitions. And our professor, Professor Evans, a professor of modern world history, is a good example of such a profile. Professor Evans graduated from the University of Warwick with a first class honors degree in history with German. He earned his PhD from the University College Dublin. He is a co-director of the university's European Institute, which is our joint collaboration with the Catholic University in Lille. He has been the unit of assessment coordinator for the RAF assessment exercise I talked about for the history unit. He also chairs the Global Hope Com uh, Committee, which oversees the university's international volunteering program. And, and as part of that, he leads projects in Peru. His publication track record is consistently of internationally excellent quality. Uh, for example, his biography of the late international footballer, Alan McLaughlin, was shortlisted for, for Irish Sports Book of the Year 2014. And his publications have been praised in review by commentators such as Fintan O'Toole and Robert Fisk. On his latest book, monograph, entitled Feeding the People in Wartime Britain, the MP Ian Byrne, the parliamentary lead for the, the, the right to food campaign writes, he comments, and I quote, in exploring the historical approach to food poverty, Bryce's work is invaluable in helping shape policy approaches today to help tackle the cost of living crisis we face and is an integral part of our right to food campaign. Professor Evans, is the author of six monographs, including the first, History of Food Aviation, published last year, and the History of Social Eating in 20th Century Britain, just published last month. Professor Evans is an elected fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He is a Churchill Lifetime Fellow, a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He has held externally funded research fellowships and scholarships at a dozen uh, research institutes, ins institutions worldwide, including two US presidential libraries. He is a regular contributor to international media. Um, in fact, 
the, uh, during the last week of the US presidential election of 2016 between uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, his Washington Post video on the history of election cake went viral in the USA. Professor, Aarons, uh, Professor Evans has carried out advocacy roles for food poverty and several, uh, with several bodies, including the UK Parliament. He has uh, received substantial funding from a number of externally funding bodies, research funding bodies, including the Arts and Humanities Research Council, or AHRC, the Wellcome Trust, the Institute of Historical Research, the Economic History Society, and the Science History Institute. Such a range of achievements explains the designation of his personal chair as one in modern world history. So without further ado, it is now a genuine delight and joy for me to invite Professor Evans to deliver to us his inaugural lecture entitled, The Most Important Thing in the World, Absence and Abundance in, the modern, in modern History. Right. Thank you, uh, Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellor, distinguished guests, colleagues, former colleagues, students, former students. Uh, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for coming this evening. I am reliably informed that the pop singer Harry Styles is performing near here this evening, so it's very gratifying that you've come here to see me instead of him. And particular thank you to my family, who, a lot of uh, whom and close friends have come quite a long way this evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Mila Buikas, Dorf Margus, gracias uh, for coming. And welcome to all of you, welcome to this venue, this beautiful venue. And some, obviously some of you work here, some of you study here, some of you may not have been here before to our beautiful campus. And uh, to uh, this, the Senate Room of the University. And it's also the, the Chapel of St. Catharines. Uh, and because we're here, I'm minded, uh, I'm reminded rather, of some advice that was given to me 10 years ago, when, when the last time I had to do one of these kind of things, really, when I was launching my first book in Dublin, which was a political biography. And the, the guy launching my book for me uh, was the late Frank Kelly. Uh, now, some of you may be familiar with the television show Father Ted. Yeah, so you might have seen Father Ted. And Frank Kelly played Father Jack in Father Ted, so. <laughs> Uh, he was a very dissolute, uh, drunken, wayward priest, but he was actually a very accomplished man, uh, Frank Kelly, and a very erudite and well-spoken man, quite contrary to his on-screen persona. And so when he was launching the book, the reason he was launching it, by the way, was his father was a political caricaturist who'd done a lot of cartoons of my biographical subjects, none of them favorable, um, but uh, that was why he was launching it. And I said to Frank, or the late, the late Frank Kelly, would you please give me some tips? Because, you know, he's a guy of stage and screen, some tips on public speaking. And he turned to me quick as a flash, in character as uh, Father Jack, and he said, when you're public speaking, never forget you are the priest, and they are the congregation, and they must mind their manners. <laughs> and, uh, and he threw in a couple of expletives. I'm not going to repeat that there. But that's advice that stood me in good stead. Um, but of course, I don't aspire to any priestly role, nor do I expect you to, to mind your manners particularly this evening, apart from maybe in the questions and answers later on. Um, but I'm also, on, on the topic of priestly advice, I'm, I'm reminded by uh, colleagues uh, of the cloth that it is the eve of Corpus Christi this evening. So fitting then uh, that we turn to food, which is the topic of today's lecture. And it's on twin phenomena, which I think are the two great drivers of history. On the one hand, absence, and on the other, abundance, and it comes in six chapters. Uh, so I, I, I hope to entertain you. If, you. if you're not that entertained, you'll know where we are with the six chapters. You'll know how long we have till the end, so there, there you go. And I'm gonna start with an example of the latter, uh, which is abundance. Okay, so my first chapter is entitled, Come Fly With Me, and I'd like you please to indulge in a little role play with me, uh, if you will. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're flying first class Pan American Airways in the 1960s, settle into your ample, comfortable chairs. For those of you on the red seats, this will be an easier exercise than you at the very back. Uh, you're on a lovely, comfortable airline seat. Imagine Sinatra's Come Fly With Me. You're on top of the world. You're on top of the social pyramid, indeed. You may peruse the extensive menu 
Will, it, will you have the hen marinated in Madeira sauce? Will you have the steak drenched in butter? Will you have the medallions of lamb? What a choice. I mean, how different to Ryanair today. Um, and as you're pursuing the menu, a glamorous flight attendant in Panam blue may lean over your shoulder and offer you a glass of lavishly expensive Bordeaux selected especially for this flight. So literally and metaphorically, you are high dining. And this is a vision, a high-end vision of abundance that we're all familiar with from the second half of the 20th century. It's the subject, a quick book plug, it's the subject of this book uh, that I'm holding in my hand as well. But it's essentially the American model of whatever you want, whenever you want it, in whatever quantity, regardless of the time or the season or the origin of the food, you can have it in great quantities if you wish. You can have it delivered by your favorite brands. This is American globalization, US-led globalization, modernity, technology, abundance. It's the vision of abundance we're all familiar with. In the words of the Pan Am marketing of the era, and I quote, in the jet age, the passenger will eat breakfast in Tokyo and arrive in San Francisco three hours before the meal he just ate. So why am I getting you to imagine you're sitting on board a now defunct luxury airline? Because I want to share with you some of the research I carried out for that book I just mentioned. Uh, and I wrote this book, The First History of Food and Aviation, uh, because you know airline food is something a lot of people would rather forget, I think, uh, published last year. Now, um, I see a lot of my colleagues here tonight, a lot of other historians who will attest that uh, the historian's labor is not fun a lot of the time. You're in archives a lot of the time. Sometimes. Uh, a lonely and hostile environment. But in 2018, I was lucky enough to visit Miami, and I was lucky enough to, to hang out with these lovely ladies uh, who um, were part of an oral history. The, 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 the book was based on archival research, but there was an oral history component, so I was interviewing people. And uh, I was research researching in the Pan Am archive in the University of Miami, but I met at, at an event one of these ladies, an octogenarian, who invited me to her suburban bungalow to meet her former flight attendant friends, uh, who, all of whom were dressed in their original flight attendant uniforms, which I think you'll agree is, is quite a feat. And they recreated the first class dining experience for me, only on the ground. So when people ask me what's the best airline meal I've ever had, it was firmly on the ground. And it was an Epicurean feast. It was eight courses. When I entered the, the, I mean, they like to do this kind of role play in America. When I entered the house, I was instructed, you're entering a plane. I was given a ticket. The cutlery and the crockery was all Pan Am. Everything was Pan Am. They'd quite literally taken all the relics of the airline with them when it had become defunct in 1991. I even went to the toilet. There were Pan Am toothpicks, Pan Am towels. <laughs> Everything was Pan Am branded with the exception of the toilet paper. So what I was being presented was uh, with in that quite odd uh, experience, which in some ways almost resembled one of those Louis Theroux weird weekends in America, was uh, an inimitable glimpse on what in 1941 Life magazine proclaimed the American century, distinct from the tyranny of old European colonialism and the absence associated with Soviet communism. American-led free trade abundance would be transmitted via new technologies such as the airplane. The globalizing ambitions of America, that great nation of nations, were associated above all with two brands. First of all, Coca-Cola, and secondly, Pan Am. And it's amazing when you, when you look at movies from the era of the 50s right up until the 80s, how much Pan Am appears as a brand. And why is that significant? Well, because it's soft power. It's 20th century capitalist abundance itself. It's the new world transporting a new form of civilization to the old. But it was all, of course, uh, a myth. Despite the pretensions of Pan Am, the industrially processed standardized airline frozen meal would give rise to the much less glamorous TV dinner or microwave meal, part of an unhealthy and homogenizing American fast food culture offering sameness, McDonaldization, or if you like, uh, in this image, coca colonization. This American vision of global abundance would end up repeating actually the old mistakes of European imperialism with the attendant ecological and human rights abuses most notably the CIA-controlled United Fruit Company, which would prop up dictator after dictator in banana republics across Latin America in order to guarantee a mass market on America's doorstep. And the glamorous and beautiful Pan Am flight attendant, well, unfortunately, they were the product of a very racist and sexist selection process in which people were fired or hired on the basis of, for example, how feminine their hands looked, because so much serving, of course, done with the hands. Subject like cattle to regular weight checks 
on a weekly basis, forced to wear girdles, trained to put up with groping from male customers and colleagues, and sometimes, as these ladies revealed to me, actually during the interview process itself. So I tried to raise some of these negative points that day with my lady hosts in Miami, but they were having none of it, which I think in itself is quite revealing. They were in that inimitably American way, still fiercely loyal to the company, fiercely loyal to Pan Am, 40 years after its demise, still unassailable, that company, that brand. So what does that brand loyalism tell us? I think it tells us much about the, capita the character of capitalist abundance in the 20th and early 20th first century, outstripping the Catholic Church, big firms are now the strongest multinational institutions, transporting technology and resources, not least food. It's also, I think, a system dangerously geared towards the very unrealistic notion of never-ending growth and never-ending abundance. Okay, so we're on to chapter two. And, oh no, I won't wait for the bell. Okay, let's get on to chapter two. Let's, let's rewind history a bit. Now, if you walk to the other side of campus here, uh, you will come to the university's Rose Garden. And in the Rose Garden, uh, written on the glass surrounding the garden, are many quotes from eminent individuals in history, um, reflections mostly on plants and flowers and growing, including this one from Gandhi. And Gandhi said, to forget how to dig the earth and to tend the soil is to forget ourselves. And Gandhi knew this better than most. Gandhi, we might be, you know, in the food sense, familiar with his famous salt marshes, marches, but also Gandhi founded several agricultural colonies in South Africa, and these were devoted to defeating colonialism through sustainable food practices, through sustainable production, consumption, and the growing of food. So Gandhi knew what he was talking about, and Gandhi's reflection speaks to the fact that agriculture has been the main source of livelihood for humanity for going on eight millennia now. From the growth of farming in the Middle East to modern global agro-industry. In modern history, the Industrial Revolution may grab all the headlines, but it wouldn't have been possible without the preceding agricultural revolution. Jethro Tull, not the prog rock group, Jethro Tull with his seed drill, crop rotation, nitrates in the soil. The main impact of that agricultural revolution was more abundant food. And with that more abundant food, sustainable growths in population. And that broke for the first time the wave cycle of abundance followed by crashing absence. And it prompted that great prophet of doom, Thomas Malthus, pictured here, to imply that the occasional famine was no bad thing. In fact, the occasional famine was necessary to keep an overabundant global population in check, the famous Malthusian trap. With absence and death for the many established as providential, and while their colonial subjects starved to death in their droves, Britain's ruling elite indulged in elaborate displays of abundance. In 1817, you can see the menu here from the Prince Regent, later George IV's banquet at the Brighton Pavilion for Grand Duke Nicholas of Russia. A hundred dishes prepared specially by celebrity chef Antonin Carême. Of course, the French Revolution spurred the great French chef, but we, that, that's a side topic. They included on the menu a giant replica of the Royal Pavilion itself rendered in pastry and a great sturgeon drenched in champagne. So this is indulgence. These days, the avoidance of absolute absence, on the other hand, on, in other words, famine, is the marker of any humane state in the world. And unfortunately, Britain signally failed this test in the modern imperial period, most notably in Ireland and in India. But at the same time as Britain was allowing famine to stalk its empire, 19th century Britain was regarded, and still is regarded in some sections of the world, as a progressive world power. How do we explain this seeming paradox? Well, I think as a, a, an economic historian, it's all to do with the economic systems at play and the notions of absence and abundance which they engendered. The economic system under which European powers encouraged the slave trade was mercantilism. Mercantilism held that a nation could achieve abundance by maximizing exports and minimizing imports, spurring colonial slave exploitation through sugar plantations in the Caribbean, for example. The mercantilist vision of abundance was essentially a selfish one of winner takes all. And if we look at this image of some smug, uh, well-fed banqueting burgers from the Dutch age uh, of greatness that is conveyed. Echoing the Bible on how man cannot live by bread alone, Claude Fischler writes, and I quote, 
Man feeds not only on carbs, proteins, and fats, but on symbols, myths, and fantasies. It's so true. If you think of any foodstuff, for example, the apple, and I've just remembered I was going to bring an apple as a prop, but I've forgotten my apple. But, but think of the apple, for example, just one foodstuff. The number of myths dedicated to that, Adam and Eve, the Trojan War, Snow White. Um, and in this painting, we have food as myth, as symbol, as fantasy. In this case, food as status, trade, wealth. This is a new commercial class who no longer need the old faith or the old order. They have the foodstuffs of exploitation quite literally within easy reach. Now, this global economic order would change, and it would change in 1815 with British victory over Napoleon at Waterloo. This event was memorably described by one French historian as, and I quote, the triumph of the sons of beer, the British and the Prussians, over the sons of wine, i.e. the French. Um, I'm not actually sure how much the old grain versus grape dichotomy determined the outcome. In fact, Wellington's colleague, the Prussian commander, uh, Blücher, pictured there on the left, actually bathed in a bath of brandy before that battle. So it's obviously nonsense, isn't it? But Waterloo's real significance lies in the British embrace of free trade, which followed it. 19th century free trade was a vision of abundance that was, of course, still imperial, still greedy, but at the same time more universalist, I would argue, than mercantilism. What do I mean by universalist? Well, big banking firms such as the Rothschilds, working in tandem with British imperialists, now offered credit worldwide. And in some cases, they actively encouraged democracy over autocracy in borrowing countries, the theory being that if the creditor class in recipient countries was better represented, the better their credit worthiness. Hence, Britain supported the Latin American freedom struggles in the 19th century against the Spanish Empire. And in that part of the world, Britain retains, I think, the sort of progressive image that it loses elsewhere, especially compared to what preceded it, which was the brute extraction of Latin America's resources by the Spanish. But it's too easy, I think, to run with this rather Whiggish idea of British progressiveness. Let's not forget, or let's not diminish, the noble intentions, the moral intentions of the abolitionist movement, but also remember that slavery was abolished for economic as well as moral reasons. The world was moving towards a different global model of finance in which sugar plantations would become still important but less important. You only have to look to the ownership records of one of our most beautiful stately homes, speak hall up the road here to see that this was the case. Up until the 19th century, many of the owners of this place were sugar planters, and then the source of wealth tends to move uh, elsewhere. So the 19th century, what I'm telling you is, it's based on credit going global. It's based on British gunboat diplomacy enforcing free trade, or so-called free trade, from China to the Ottoman Empire to Persia. And incredibly, in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, Britain with the abolition of the Corn Laws, goes as far as ending protectionism for its own agriculture. So this was the free trade, the laissez-faire century. At the same time, these hugely unequal income levels in the colonies would lead to appalling instances of absence. A single mega famine in India in 1897 would cost five and a half million lives. I really think that figure bears repeating. Five and a half million lives in one year. That's five times as many people died across the seven years of the Great Irish Famine, which we're probably more familiar with, in just one year. So if we consider that these appalling famines happened at the height of British free trade globalism, I think that we come to one of the distinguishing features of capitalism, which I would argue is artificial absence. Capitalism is perhaps only 500 years old. Before capitalism, we had markets, we had trade. So what changes? I'd argue that modern capitalism, whether in this period of mercantilism or British high imperialism, or indeed today, is distinguished by three key features. First of all, land enclosure or privatization. Second, expansion based upon debt or credit. And thirdly, and I think most importantly for this lecture, artificial absence. The creation of absence where it doesn't exist in the interests only of the market. We're going to move on to chapter three. And this brings us to the 20th century and the nightmare of deliberate absence. It will get a little bit more upbeat, but we've got a few famines to get through yet. If the British way of market-driven artificial absence or famine could be said to be hands-off, laissez-faire, then the scramble for Africa in the late 20th century, early, uh, sorry, late 19th century, early 20th century, had a more deliberate and direct 
infliction of starvation as a weapon of war. Now, starvation as a weapon of war is, is age old. You read the Roman military texts, De Re Militari, it says, Stay, starve your opponent to death. But when we get that deliberate starvation as uh, a weapon of war in the 20th century, uh, the early scramble for Africa is that harbinger of mass starvation. And for anyone who still regards the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages, so-called, let's take a look at the 20th century, this nightmare century, this century of deliberate absence, Nazi Germany starving millions of Slavs, Jews, Sinti, and Roma to death during World War II via its hunger plan. But starving to death takes a long time, and so the process of starving people to death was sped up by the Nazis through the implementation of the final solution. They're intimately linked. The often forgotten genocidal blueprint for the Nazis actually came earlier, in 1904. It's usually forgotten about. And that's when the Germans in 1904 put down a rising in German Southwest Africa, Namibia today, by very deliberately starving 60,000 people to death. They purposely and intentionally encircled mass populations, cut off all the food supply, and then just waited for these people to die. And then they moved into these so-called hunger zones shoveling the dead and dying into mass pits shaped like sardines. There's a clear but largely unacknowledged connection between this genocide of the Herero in Namibia in 1904 and Nazi agronomist Herbert Backer's hunger plan of World War II, which, as I mentioned, precedes the Holocaust. The forgotten Namibian genocide then preceded the first total war, the First World War, and that was really when the old economic rules completely fell apart. The Russian Revolution in 1917 and the Bolsheviks' default on old debts owed to the old imperial nations like France and Britain and the US. And it signals a new era of absence and abundance, a new world order in which authoritarian regimes like the Soviet Union, like Nazi Germany, now pursued deliberate absence on an appalling scale. 20 million people died of starvation in World War II. That's a million more than the 19 million who died as a result of combat. 20 million deaths from deliberately inflicted absence in just six years. But within this new world order, in this country and others, new models of abundance for all were born. And I'd like to turn now to my second book plug of the evening, which is this one here. This book published last month, and as Professor Nagar mentioned, all about public feeding in Britain during the First and Second World Wars. And before I tell you about it, I have to tell you uh, that I have a little bit of a bone to pick with George Orwell. Uh, now, I'm a great fan of George Orwell uh, in many respects. In fact, I've actually stolen the title of this very lecture from Orwell, because Orwell writes, when I was a small boy at school, a lecturer used to come in once a term and deliver talks on famous battles. He was fond of quoting Napoleon's maxim, an army marches on its stomach. And at the end of his lecture, he would suddenly turn to us and demand of us boys, what's the most important thing in the world? And we were expected to shout back, food. So I'm with Orwell there. And like I say, I've stolen his title. But in his dystopian novel, 1984, Orwell turned the popular wartime BBC canteen in London, where he ate every single day, into an authoritarian nightmare in which pinkish gray sludge is doled out to the miserable proles. Perhaps some of you know the scene, if you look at that scene from the movie there. I don't think the image of canteen dining in this country has ever recovered from it. And yet, compared to the basic food bank today, public feeding in wartime Britain was a lot less Orwellian. The government tried to feed everyone nutritiously. It was a vision of abundance in which the British government moved for once out of the Dickensian model of feeding only the deserving poor, please sir can I have some more, towards a vision of abundance which might be described as food for all. Britain's public canteens were far from their Stalinist equivalents in Russia which were distinguished by rats, ideologically, yet, uh, ideologically pure yet incompetent chefs and the eternal reek of cabbage. By contrast, Britain's canteens had to turn over a profit. They were well-decorated, tablecloths, pianos, and uh, flowers. Celebrity chefs of the day were recruited to design the dishes, like this man pictured on the left. Man of action and celebrity Edwardian vegetarian Eustace Miles, another man forgotten by history, who etymologists among you might be interested to hear, I think is the first man to be described as a nutter because he invented the nut-based energy bar we're all familiar with today. Abundance as a market of civilization was emphasized by Winston Churchill, 
who, in backing public canteens in World War II, insisted that they avoid the taint of the Dickensian workhouse. Accordingly, these were, relative to what we have today, sites of civilization. At their peak, there were two and a half thousand of these communal canteens across the country. There was one on every high street. By way of comparison, the number of McDonald's we have in this country today is about half that figure. In fact, two and a half thousand, that's around about the number of food banks we have today. And they were championed by very unlikely people, from the writer Barbara Cartland to Margaret Thatcher's father, the grocer and politician, Alf Roberts. Along with food rationing, public feeding in wartime Britain worked. The country avoided absence and to a large extent achieved fair shares for all. And for those of you born in this country in the 1940s and 50s, you'll also be delighted to hear that British wartime diet produces babies with bigger brain sizes than ever before or since. Crucial first 100 days of nutrition. Among the great champions of nutritious state-subsidized canteen dining were William Beveridge, the director of the LSE and the architect of our welfare state, and the Scottish nutritionist John Boyd Orr, pictured there on the right. Now, Boyd Orr was uh, the first director general of the United Nations FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, based in Rome. And Boyd Orr once lamented, and I think this is very prescient for today, that people, some people on the political right in his time genuinely held the opinion that malnutrition could not exist if people were not visibly dying of starvation. And if you read the UK parliamentary debate around school holiday hunger from just last year, around the campaign by footballer Marcus Rashford, it is clear that such opinions definitely still exist today. From the 1950s onwards, social eating in this country, I'm afraid, became passé, Orwellian. Post-war Germany, by contrast, embraced enthusiastically canteen dining, going from hungry, starving, bombed out people scrabbling around in the ruins for food to the 1976 West German labor law, which decreed that half the seats on company boards had to be given to workers, ensuring that just as workers didn't feel out of place in the boardroom, bosses didn't feel out of place in the communal workplace canteen. All sat at the common table. Let's move on to chapter four and the so-called Green Revolution. Uh, as you'll have gathered, I am a great defender of collectivism in food at the consumption end of things, but it doesn't always work at the production end. The march away from feudalism and towards farm ownership in Europe and Europe's colonies occurred later in Russia. In Russia, it was followed by the Stalinist collectivization of agriculture and the formation of monster collective farms. Although these reforms promised abundance for all, they in fact resulted in terrible absence, famines in which millions of people perished. And the same story occurred in China. Mao, whose rise to power during the Chinese Civil War was largely due to the promise to the people of rice, would imitate the Soviet example between 58 uh, and 62 with horrific results. At least 45 million people died unnecessarily between 58 and 62 in China. By complete and total contrast, the post-war American century would be founded on the viable promise of abundance. Something happened between the great summits of the Allied leaders at Yalta and Potsdam in 1945, and that was the atom bomb, of course. Changed the world and made America the undisputed world power. But at the same time that the atom bomb was being tested successfully in the New Mexico desert, something else was happening too. At the same time, a group of American scientists working in Mexico under this man, agronomist Norman Borlaug, made a similarly astonishing breakthrough, developing techniques for crossbreeding, harvesting, and planting seeds in order to produce disease-resistant wheat. The so-called Green Revolution, genetically modified food, was underway. By 1963, Mexico was producing six times as much wheat per year as in the year before Borlaug and his pals arrived. Borlaug would go on to revolutionize the agriculture of other countries with perennial food supply problems, most notably India and Pakistan. And he was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. Since the 60s, the rate of food production in India and Pakistan has increased faster than that of population growth. Spectacularly then, it seems, in recent history, that the old Malthusian trap of famine had been overcome across the world. From sub-Saharan Africa to China, for the first time in history, universal abundance was a realistic possibility. 
But of course, the genetically modified miracle cure by which abundance would replace absence permanently came with its own problems, the human and ecological risks of inorganic fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. And meanwhile, five miles up in the air, these concerns were starting to filter through to Pan Am and its elite customers. Let's return to the flight attendants. The flight attendants tell me that in this era, 70s onwards, their elite customers increasingly want local, fresh, organic. Somewhat paradoxically, in an intensively globalized world, consumers are now looking for organic authenticity in food and food service. And I think this is quite vividly illustrated by the recollections of an African-American woman who flew Pan Am's Caribbean routes. And she recalled an exchange during meal service in the 1970s with an affluent white female passenger who was dressed in furs. And this woman remarked, and I quote to her, my goodness, your English is so good. My husband thinks you're from Jamaica, but I bet you're from Trinidad. And she recalls how their faces dropped in disappointment when she revealed she was in fact from inner city Philadelphia. But that tells us a lot, doesn't it? It tells us about those, those expectations of authenticity. And in this golden age of the American century, that brave new world of universal abundance, those old colonial notions were clearly alive and well when it came to food, consumption, and delectation, as we can see from this poster very much of its time. And so too, I think, in our modern obsession perhaps with authenticity in our diet, we are perhaps echoing the warnings of an earlier age about overconsumption. Perhaps we are back to historic warnings about overabundant excess seen in the drawings of William Hogarth. But instead now, perhaps of moral dangers, these are biological dangers. I'm going to move on to chapter five and wind towards some kind of conclusion here uh, by talking about another kind of abundance. And I think that's the overabundance of biographies of great men or women, but usually men uh, in history. And I say this as a historical professional. I want to state unequivocally that our way of reading history is all wrong. Thomas Carlyle supposed that power should be given unconditionally to great men. Heroes who should not be answerable to institutions, who should not be answerable to the rules of inferior men. How can anyone familiar with the rise to power of Adolf Hitler still subscribe to Carlyle's views, you might think? Well, they do. We still do. We still obsess about great individuals in history. There are hundreds of biographical studies of Winston Churchill, for example. And by comparison, very, very few history books which adopt the long view. Now, ironically, this was confirmed to me while undertaking research in Peru many years ago as a Winston Churchill fellow. Winston Churchill Memorial Trust is a fine institution, actually. And I was there to research Peru's long and bloody civil war. And I suppose I was, in consistency with my historical training, looking for a heroic figure in that tragic story of that country. And I found no one except collectively the thousands upon thousands of humble and completely historically anonymous women who ran Comodores Populares, communal dining rooms in slums, who quite simply for about two decades prevented mass famine by serving cheap and nutritious food to millions of people, and who were rewarded by being assassinated, not only by the Maoist rebels who saw their nutritious mission as not revolutionary enough, as a prop to the capitalist system, but also by government special forces who perceived their model of social eating as inherently communist and revolutionary. These poor, brave women were stuck in the middle, and I have such utmost respect for them. Way back in 1961, the great historian E.H. Carr, whose book is pictured there on the right, talked about the essence of history, and he said the essence of history is causality, or put simply, the question why. And Carr exposed the nonsense of the more ardent great man theories of causality by going back to Cleopatra's nose. If Cleopatra's nose had been shorter, the French writer Blaise Pascal wrote, the whole face of the world would have been changed. In other words, if Cleopatra didn't have such a long, seductive nose, Mark Antony wouldn't have been seduced by her, Octavian and the Roman people wouldn't have turned against Mark Antony, and Octavian would never have become Caesar Augustus, the first Roman emperor. 
and the Roman Empire, and by dint, civilization as we know it would never have begun. And Carr pulls no punches in discussing this example. He says this sort of history is highly amusing, but it's complete rubbish. Undoubtedly, our tendency to look to the heroic individual is a primordial one. It's rooted in the heroes and gods of ancient myth. It's comforting in many ways. Even in antiquity, however, greatness depends on abundance. It depends on climate, it depends on farming. Ancient Greece, ancient Greece has great periods of absence, but nothing on the scale of the famines in the Near Eastern world or medieval Europe. The prosperity of Rome, ancient Rome. It's not just the greatness of its emperors and generals, but it's the so-called warm period in the third and fourth centuries BC. And then in the fourth century AD, again, changing the world forever, Eastern Asia suffers a mega drought, driving a certain tribe of nomadic warriors called the Huns west to where the grass was greener. My point here is that climate and food and therefore abundant resources are the great motor of history, not the great individual. And if we were to go farther back, what is the origin of civilization, or at least civilization as we understand it? It is farming. Farming is the cradle of civilization, the so-called fertile crescent around the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. In 14th century Europe, the misfortune of abundant rain and absent harvests, coupled of course with plague, was blamed on various different causes. Jews, the usual scapegoat, sodomites, evil vapors, even overly moist sexual organs. But really, the populations were undernourished. That was the root cause. And shortly thereafter this period, the spice trade drives exploration and globalization. Let's not forget that the desire to find a spice route to India explains the mistaken discovery of the Americas by Columbus. So to come back to how history is written, I'd like to highlight the work of the famous Annal School of Historians in France, many of whom were themselves targeted by the Nazi regime and have become a little like patron saints to some of us in the historical profession. And of these, perhaps the most extraordinary was a man called Fernand Brodel. And Brodel coined the term geohistory. Brodel began writing his doctoral thesis on Philip II of Spain and his policies in the Mediterranean, but then he turned the title on its head. Instead of his original title, Philip II and Spanish policy in the Mediterranean, Brodel's new title became the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean world in the age of Philip II. In doing this then, the sea, the mountains, the food, the peninsulas, the Mediterranean possessed the agency, not the great man, not the king. But don't just take it from me that the great man theory of history is wrong-headed. Let's listen to the great men themselves. Charles de Gaulle, a great man amongst great French men, who famously lamented the, the impossibility of properly governing a country in which there are 246 varieties of cheese. Or Bismarck, who once reflected, I think, very wisely that there are only two things people don't want to know how are made, laws and sausages. But who also said, did Bismarck, and I quote, individuals cannot create or divert the stream of time, they can only travel upon it and try to avoid shipwreck. Okay, thank you for your uh, attention. We're on to the final chapter now about the future of absence and abundance. In 1969, the historian David Landis published a great history of the Industrial Revolution. And that was called Prometheus Unbound. And Prometheus, of course, in Greek myth, was the titan who gave fire to mankind, and he was punished by Zeus for being bound, by being bound to a rock for all eternity. In the spirit of Prometheus Unbound, and in the search for future food sources, perhaps the latest in a long line of colonizations in the next final frontier of food is the colonization of Mars. Certainly people like Elon Musk would like to think so. But if for now we are to restrict ourselves to terra firma, it might not be a bad thing to return to the notion of the bound Prometheus in the form of realizing through climate change our limitations. And so today, an age of doubt, climate crisis, existential threat and Anthropocene age, there are several needs which we really need to face up to. Keeping fossil fuels in the ground, stopping deforestation, embracing meat-free diets, turning to plants and insects as food sources, but to ensure, I hope, that those are not ultra-processed, for food justice to be centered on the global south, not just the west, 
to challenge the potential, and I think this is a very important point, of the transnational billionaire class to create artificial absence where there is none through the purposeful limitation of biodiversity. And I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but if you look up big corporations, the privatization and copywriting of seeds, you know, the, the very basis of humanity, to go back to Ga Gandhi, privatization of seeds, we've got to guard against that. To return to Malthus, the prophet of doom, inexorable population growth, uh, I don't think, I don't agree with Malthus, I don't think it's going to outstrip food supply. Of course, contexts are very different now. But at the same time, climate change means we must shift our habits of consumption. There are many N NGOs today intercepting food that would otherwise be considered surplus, and some of them are in the room this evening, some uh, members of sort of food justice networks in Liverpool. So we have those organizations. We have, to a degree around the world, accountable governments. And for all their shortcomings, we do now have international agencies preventing famine. I mentioned the United Nations FAO and many others preventing famine today. So for all the inequalities and adulteration in our food system today, I think we do have the potential to be sustainable and creative in our food systems. But we have to realize that unceasing, unrelenting abundance is not always desirable and that the Earth's resources are finite. To quote Shakespeare's Hamlet, what a piece of work is man. We've moved from wandering bands to settled communities. We've discovered agriculture. And as I've argued to you this evening, that is perhaps the foundation of civilization as we know it. We've interrogated the meaning of life. We've created a whole range of explanations. And then as we started to understand more about the nature of the world through science, comes an industrial revolution. And that industrial revolution reshaped our planet in about 200 years, a couple of hundred years, as opposed to the thousands of years it took for agriculture. And today, relative to most of history, we have untold abundance. Surely then, mankind will ultimately be capable of recognizing that today we are in the midst of truly existential threats linked to climate change. And the alternative to changing our ways of consumption is crushing global absence. But I think we have the potential to change. And if you think that sounds too naively upbeat, a verdict on the capacity of humanity to reform, consider, if you will, the news cycle today. Headlines are immediate, rolling, sensational, bad news every minute on your phone or on your socials. The war in Ukraine causing wheat and fertilizer exports to drop drastically. But notwithstanding that, consider perhaps if newspapers were published only once every 50 or 75 or 100 years. And we got to the picture that for all the inequality in the world today, the headline would unquestionably be more positive, greater life expectancy, and much less famine. But as I said, we have to stop relying on the bad old ways. We have to stop relying on products dependent upon deforestation, notably palm oil, and we have to turn away from globalized med models, perhaps of chemical abundance, towards more organic local and regional systems. To do this, the very fabric of life must change. To come towards a definite conclusion then, Hegel claimed that history is driven by certain world historical individuals, Napoleon, Caesar, Socrates, these men who would drive us forward towards what Hegel called the end of history. And I don't agree with that. I think I'd rather go back to Herodotus the father of history, the father of my profession, who wrote about how divine intervention or the supernatural constrains men's actions. Now to give Herodotus his due, he wasn't talking about Homeric gods sweeping down and changing things. It was his way in his time, I think, of saying that individual agency is always constrained by structure. Great men are always limited by resources in history and so today. And so looking to take the lessons of history forward to the future, perhaps it is not a bad thing at all to realize that to avoid the horrid extremes of absence and abundance, Prometheus needs once again to be bound. And that as the effects of the war in Ukraine are showing right now, food indeed remains the most important thing in the world. Thank you, Sinead.